God is the ultimate judge, and he is the one who will actually do the judging in our hearts. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. As we continue to study, we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is very interesting as we study today. Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Well, you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 that thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Jesus in Luke 23 tells a thief that he will be with him in paradise. Today, I'm going to be dealing with this supposed contradiction. All right, very good. I love when Ryan does that. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. Now, what did you do today? Today is fabulous Friend Friday. We have a very special guest. You will not want to miss meeting him, so stay tuned. I look forward to that. Ryan was Ryan's friend when he was young in mm -hmm. school, so it's excellent. So get your Bible guide and your Bible, and let's begin to study 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring light to the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other, for who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us, and indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1. God sent His only Son to take care of sin and show us how to live on earth. Now, Paul the Apostle speaks to the church at Corinth and tells them the truth about the leadership in the church of Jesus Christ in this world. And the question is this, how can, in good conscience, they continue to fight and go to court suing each other and they be called spiritual leaders or ambassadors on behalf of Jesus Christ? Well, this selfishness is eventually confronted and corrected by Paul as the spiritual leader or the apostle over the Corinthian church. Paul says that as they lead for Jesus Christ, that they are not respected by the world, but they are rejected. Now, the reason is because Jesus Christ is not respected by the enemy of our soul who is in the world. He is rejected, and in this conflict, we must make a choice. Remember that Jesus Christ is Lord, and there will be an end to all of this disrespect very soon. But until then, we should remain faithful. Remain faithful. That's what the Lord is expecting us to do as we continue on 
in this journey as we go through the Bibles. Now, as we focus on this, it gets really interesting because we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and we are actually in uh, 1 through 13, and it's leaders in Christ. Now get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. If you don't have it, then you can write to us. The address is on the bottom of the screen. You can write to us that way, or you can call us, or you can actually go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on donate, make a donation there, and we'd be, we're very happy. By the way, thank you for your donations. They tremendously help us, and uh, it really is good. So thank you for giving. We really appreciate that. Anyway, um, as we focus on this, let's pray and let's ask the Lord as we look at his word, what he's telling us. Father, I pray today that you would speak to our hearts, help us to read it from the scripture. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us not to put our ideas into it, but help us to get your ideas out of it. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, everyone said, amen. Now, as we look at this, leaders in Christ, we are focused on this particular passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Here is what the Bible says. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God of God. Verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Faithful steward, that's important. Verse 3, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. Now listen carefully because he's talking about them judging him. In fact, I do not even judge myself, Paul says. He continues in verse four, for I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. He who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing, nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. And then each one's praise will come from God. Now these first passages of scripture lead us to this idea. God is the ultimate judge of our hearts and he will judge us. God is the judge. That's why we should not be judges. So remember that God knows everything that we do. He knows why we do it. Now, of course, there is courts in the world in different places, different countries, and we elect judges for courts and all that stuff. But the ultimate judge comes from God Almighty. So we have to understand that. We have to realize that. You don't just go judge somebody. Well, I think this, hold on a minute. It doesn't matter what you think, but it matters what God thinks. Now, we should get in prayer with God and we should say to the Lord, Lord, what, what help me to understand what you think and then keep it to ourselves. Very important, beloved, very important. Well, let's move on to the next scripture and learn more. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. It says, now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself, figuratively. And Apollos, for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And, and, and what do you do or, or what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Now, this is interesting. We must remember that everything we have comes from God, everything. We do not have a right to say, this is my gift, I can use it as I want. And let me tell you something, that's very true. Because when we talk about this, I learned this very uh, critically about six years ago. When we understand that it is God who gives us everything, that's how we need to remember. So it's not right for us to say, well, I'm good at this, that's my gift. Well, hold on a minute. 
It might be your gift, but remember that you did not create that gift. It was given to you by God. So we must keep that close to our hearts and keep that in mind. Now watch the next scripture. Verses eight to 13 say, you are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. Indeed, I could wish that you did reign for we also might reign with you. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. And we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we have all we have we are already poor and clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. What we have been made as filth of the world and the offscurring of all things until now. Now, what is Paul saying? What's he saying here? You see, beloved, we must remember that there is a fight in this world between Jesus Christ in us and Satan. There's a fight. Let's seek Jesus Christ and not our own desires. When we understand that and we realize that we must turn our thoughts to heaven, and begin to focus on God. What do you want to do with my neighbor? Not whether I like him or not. It doesn't matter whether I like him or not. I am told and commanded to love the people around me. So Lord, how do you want to speak to my neighbor? How do you want to speak to that person at work? How do you want to speak to that friend? That's kind of a friend. Very important. So we need to remember that we need to put God first, beloved. So we pray today, Lord, help me not to get caught up in the politics around me, but to remember your call on my life, because your call is the only thing that truly matters. And so, Lord, I give my life to you, and I ask you to help me. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this, Lord. And we all said together, amen. Join Bible Discovery TV at Answers in Genesis Gospel Reset Mega Conference this November at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Niagara Falls. Come be equipped by apologist and evangelist and a PhD scientist, including the founder of Answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, Mr. Ken Han. Don't miss out on this faith building event. Go to AnswersInGenesis.org website for information and registration. As we read through the letter of 1 Corinthians, we want to take some time to focus in on the letter itself. To whom was Paul writing? When was he writing and why? Well, knowing these factors greatly helps us to understand the contents of 1 Corinthians. Learning a little bit about the original audience is a great practice or a habit to get into before reading through any book of the Bible. Well, today, let's start with 1 Corinthians. Acts 18 tells us of the Apostle Paul's first and eventful year and a half visit to Corinth. About three years later in AD 55, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians from the city of Ephesus. A group of men had come from Corinth to visit Paul. So for the first six chapters, Paul deals with their reports of events in Corinth. The rest of the book then gives Paul's response to a letter sent to him by the Corinthians. A main issue in the Corinthian church was divisions, and Paul deals with these sharply. The exact nature of the divisions is impossible to know completely, but it is clear that there were not only physical divisions, Christians claiming to follow and pledging allegiance to certain teachers and groups, but also theological divisions. It's been suggested that the physical divisions were emphasized by the Roman system of patrons and clients, in which a wealthy person would provide for the less fortunate in return for physical work, social honor, and political support. 
support. This would account for a variety of Paul's statements on there only being a few noble wealthy in Corinth's church, his condemnation of the pride in church leaders, and his comments on lawsuits, among many others. The theological divisions can easily be seen as divided into two main Corinthian camps, the aesthetics and the hedonists. The aesthetics aimed to deny the desires of the body to the extreme. Paul deals with their false sense of maturity, their demands for celibacy even within marriage, their dietary rules, and their denial of a physical resurrection. On the opposite end, the hedonists claimed that the body was going to die anyway, so why not give it what it wants? Paul deals with their overt sexual sin, lawsuits over pride, not caring about other Christians, becoming drunk at church services, and their chaotic worship. These two extremes are shut down by Paul in 1 Corinthians, and he ends his letter with an exhortation to watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. Thanks for that, Corey. Well, today our assigned reading is 1 Corinthians 4 to 6, and you know, some see a problem in chapter 6 because Paul here says that thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God. But if you remember back to Luke chapter 23, Jesus told the thief on the cross beside him that he would be with him in paradise. So based on this, certain biblioskeptics cynically asked, can thieves inherit the kingdom of God or not? Many have been led to believe that the Bible contains many mistakes and contradictions and therefore cannot be the word of God as it claims. However, as the late Old Testament scholar Gleason Archer pointed out, it is highly significant that no such mistake has ever yet been proved to the satisfaction of a court of law, although various attempts have been made to do so. Indeed, and attempts are still being made. For example, critics point out that the Bible states that thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God, yet Jesus told a thief that he would be with him in paradise. Indeed, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Then in Luke 23, 43, Jesus says to one of the thieves, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. To answer this alleged contradiction, we need go no further than the very next verse. Indeed, in 1 Corinthians 6.11, speaking about the aforementioned list of sinners, it says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Commentator Dan Letha notes that this chapter is written to followers of Jesus Christ who have had all of their many sins forgiven and washed away by the powerful and cleansing blood of the crucified and risen Savior. And such were some of you indicates this list of sins is a record of their past, but they repented and had been freed from the bondage of their sin and became a new creation. And this is exactly what happened with the thief on the cross. He became acceptable in the sight of God because of the finished work of Christ to inherit the kingdom of God. You know, many of the alleged Bible contradictions are created by cynics who simply don't read on. And they usually don't want to read on because their goal is simply to discredit the Bible at any cost. Because if the Bible is discredited as being the revealed word of God in their minds, then they can ignore it and live their life without consequence, supposedly. But if the critic was truly interested in discovering the answer to this alleged contradiction, all he would have to do is look at the very next verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it explains that these sins were in these Christians' past. They were fornicators, idolaters, homosexuals, and thieves but they were forgiven because of the gracious sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. But does this mean that Christians are perfect? Far from it. Romans 3.23 says that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The truth is, is that we're all unworthy to inherit the kingdom of God. We're all thieves, but it's Christ and Christ alone that makes us worthy. I think it's interesting that people who are paying attention to this uh, don't 
they, they see that people just grab things in the Bible to say that it's wrong. Right. And I think yeah. that's the key. Mm -hmm. You have yeah. to study it, look at it, and understand it before right. you can figure that out. That's Very right. good. Well, today we mm -hmm. have a guest. It's Fabulous Friend Friday. <laughs> it today. is Fabulous Friend Friday. <laughs> now, uh, you said to me, Janice, mm -hmm. that you remember singing at the wedding of his parents. I do remember that. And yes, it was a very special day. They, that Now, his grandfather mm -hmm. made a crib for him and then figured out and improved on it and made a crib for us. Yes, that's Only right. He had, like made a a cradle, he had made a cradle for his grandson, and then he wanted to make it a little bit bigger and perfect it a little bit more. So when he heard that you and I were having a baby, then he made us one, which we still have. We do still so, have it, and it's Lots great. of family connections. Mm -hmm. There is. Wonderful. I, I would mm -hmm. like to introduce you to Ryan DeWeird. Ryan, yes. welcome. Good Thank to have you here. You. Thank you for having me. And you, you are, and, and, and the, first of all, the, the roots here. Now, you two know each other, Ryan we and Ryan. We do, yeah. Yes, we do, yeah. <laughs> how do you know each other? Ryan, how do you know? Well, we went to the same school growing up. He was one grade ahead of me, so... Um, yeah, that's how we know each other. <laughs> Brampton Christian School. So that's where you... At the time, it was KRTCS. Yeah. yeah. Oh, KRT right. Christian Schools. Kennedy yeah. Road Tabernacle Christian, Christian Schools. Schools. Yeah. That's right, yeah. All right, very good. So you you played around in class and did some stuff, or you were pretty calm? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Passed each other in the hallway. Yeah, that's right. Some yeah. conversations. <laughs> yeah. Pretty cool at that time. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. When you're in school at that age, one year makes a huge big difference, you know? <laughs> it's it does. true. It yeah. does, it's yes. true. We're going to spend some time with you over the next uh, week because it's important that people understand what you're doing and how you're doing it. You, you ended up in, and you live now in, the Dominican Republic That's with right. your beautiful, amazing wife mm. and two amazing children. Four <laughs> years old and two years old? Uh, five and three. Five and, and three. three. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get it sooner or later. <laughs> five and three. So the oldest is five and, and her, uh, her name is? Liberty. 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 Excellent name. And your youngest son is? Edison. Edison, Liberty and Edison, That's very right. good. They live in Dominican Republic. Yes, they do. Yeah. So how long have you been down there? So I've been down there 12 and a half years, believe it or not, and uh, time so has flown. <laughs> you, yeah, time has flown. So you went down there at a young age, and, yeah. and the reason you're down there, tell me about your calling before you got married. Yep. Tell me about your sense of feeling God was calling you. Oh, so I, I grew up in a, a missional, church, a very missions-minded church in Brampton, Ontario, and uh, they would have missionaries every Sunday, and from a young age I could just sense something was pulling me to the nations, something outside of, of our culture here. I would love traveling, would love to uh, hear about the stories of what God was doing all around the world. Something was inevitably attracting me and pulling me, and I didn't understand it at the time, uh, but after I graduated from the University of Toronto um, for computer engineering, I went to some missions conferences, and I was involved in my local church, and I remember one particular missions conference, I was sitting down in Wycliffe Bible Translators Workshop. And they were talking about how they translate the scriptures, and I love languages and linguistics, and how they translate the scriptures in different languages and take it overseas and to people that don't have the Bible in their own language. And it was a very simple but powerful realization as I was sitting there, uh, no big voice from heaven speaking to me, but I just knew it at one moment to another that I would be going full-time overseas missions in another country. I didn't know what it would look like. Mm -hmm. and uh, so, so you, sitting there in the Wycliffe Bible Translator's yep. place, uh, you sense in your spirit that God... Now, how old were you? Uh, I was about 24 years old at the time. That's, that's young. Yeah. So, so, yeah. You're, you're, so you sensed in your spirit you're yep. going to go for missions. Were you going to be a Bible translator? Well, I, I was open to whatever it would be. I didn't know that I was going to be a Bible translator, so I was going to get my feet wet and go somewhere for one to three months and, uh, and see what God would, uh, would kind of, how he would lead me. What did he do? Well, he connected with me with uh, some longtime friends and pastors of mine uh, from the Brampton, Ontario area who had moved to the Dominican Republic. And they invited me to come down and do a three-month internship with them. I live with them and uh, fell in love with the Dominican Republic and what God was doing, the Spanish language, and just ministering to the people there. Okay, so, so you, were, you were taken by this place and 
you go down there and you're rooming with the pastors and you're doing all of this. So you're, you're pretty much alone and you're just trying to you get a feel for this and the occupation of working with these people mm -hmm. is dominating your mind. Mm -hmm. Now, was this the only time you went? So I went for three summers consecutively. Three years in a row. Three, <laughs> three summers. So I was still finishing up schooling and then I started to work full time after graduating. And uh, what, what did you school in? So c computer engineering. So you're a computer engineer. Yeah, well, studied it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so, the plans, so, huh? you, so what is that, four years or it, three years? Four years. Yeah. Okay, so you're a computer engineer and you're captivated with the Dominican Republic and the yeah. people there and, and you're, you've got us spoken to you in this time mm. and it's very interesting. Now, on the next program, we're going to pick up from there and talk about what happened then because we're in this process because this is a really interesting time of when God really touched you. Mm. And let me tell you something, he really touched you. <laughs> I can see that. That's, a, that's absolutely amazing. So I want to encourage everybody who's watching today, you're going to hear this story, a computer engineer who is called away from computer engineering after he finished schooling. Mm -hmm. That's something else. I want to tell you something. God has plans for your life. You may not know what they are, but trust me, God knows exactly what they are. And so you need to pray and you need to ask God and you need to say, Lord, help me to do this. Some people may be called overseas. Some people may not, but they may, but everybody is called to support the work of God. And that's what we need to remember. We need to remember that as we support the work of God, God fulfills his calling in our life. And that's very, very important. So, and also I want to say that God still talks to you in the Bible. Obviously, I think his Bible is more relevant today than it has been in the past. So my suggestion is join us as we continue to read through the Bible. God is talking to you. Make sure you're listening.